you're set. So today we're going to be talking about the power of Nebraska Native Plants, Audubon's Plants for Birds program, and the projects that we've undertaken over the past couple of years to help make urban spaces a lot more valuable for birds. And we're hoping to share information with you about how you can make your own community more beneficial for birds and how Audubon can be helpful with that. So the National Audubon Society has developed five major strategic priorities that are critical for bird conservation. And the Plants for Birds program falls within the bird friendly communities priority. So it was developed because of course, we've come to know that um, the suburban and urban areas are critical for birds. And we know we can work to make them more supportive during the different stages of bird life cycles. And one way to do that is by transforming lawns into long-term habitat with native plants rather than using non-natives and ornamentals. And also to do this, we're working with Audubon chapters, centers, state programs, and all of our many partners to help inspire people to make everyday actions that make our communities safer and healthier for birds and people. So with the Bird Friendly Communities Program, oops, sorry. With the Bird Friendly Communities Program and the Plants for Birds Program, we are focused on giving the birds that we love the four basic things that they need to live, which are food, shelter, safe passage, and of course, places to raise their young. And we do that by transforming yards into long-term valuable habitats. So in Nebraska, we've been doing the Plants for Birds Program for about two years. But the umbrella project that National developed has been around for about four now. And we put a heavy emphasis on using native plants at all levels from federal to local to individual with whatever resources you have, whether it's as small as a windowsill to um, your entire backyard to use those native plants for the advantage of birds, giving them better habitat than those non-natives can provide, which we'll talk about quite a bit later. And within the Plants for Birds program, and in addition to planting those native plants in our yards, we have the uh, resources that Audubon provides for civic engagement through the Plants for Birds PRO program. And PRO stands for Proclamation, Resolution, and Ordinance. And we're using those to make a measurable, lasting impact around native plant use in our communities. So on the PRO scale, so to speak, it ranges from short-term proclamations, which are used for raising awareness within the public, to building ordinances, which affect laws and take longer-term effect. Um, for example, an ordinance we might want to try for is um, encouraging the, native, the use of native plants in medians rather than ornamentals. So why is the Plants for Birds program important? Why are we doing it? And why is, it, why is it important that um, other people kind of look more into our program? Um, well, according to a recent study in 2018, and it was published in Science Journal, um, we've lost more than one in four birds within the last 50 years in North America. And that equates to about 2.9 billion birds that are gone since 1970. And that's quite concerning. And among um, the most sharply declining groups of birds are the grassland birds, which have declined by about 53% in the last 90 years. Next slide, Casey, thanks. And 41% of these declining species are neotropical migrants or those that spend their winters in South and Central America and their summers and their breeding grounds in North America. And hundreds of species migrate through um, each flyway, um, which is represented by each of the lines on this globe um, every spring and fall. And throughout that migratory route, they depend on a, a number of different geographic locations, um, which not only include their breeding and wintering grounds, but also a number of different stopover um, habitat or stopover regions um, which are called stopover habitat. And um, when they're flying over these areas that they might be able to use for stopover habitat, um, they face 
major threats when there are no resources for them to use to refuel them during that journey. Um, and a number of studies have shown that um, in areas that are more dominated by non-native plants, um, birds are forced to choose less preferred or lower quality resources. Um, they produce smaller clutch sizes and fewer young. They have lower reproductive success and they might even forego reproduction altogether. Um, and a lot of these uh, might equate to larger level bird population consequences. And a number of studies have shown that um, urban areas dominated by non-native non plants are population sinks for birds. And there are not a lot of different reasons why um, these stockover habitats might not be suitable for them. One of them is that over the past century, we've taken what was once a rich contiguous landscape of ecologically healthy land and um, full of native plants, and we've turned it into um, what is basically a sterile monoculture of turf grass and decorative non-native plant species. In fact, 54% of the U.S. land has been developed into what is now a suburban and urban matrix. And now only three to five percent of the American landscape um, remains as undisturbed habitat for plants and animals. And what you see now is a patchwork of cities and towns with small fragments of forested um, or I guess, habitat embedded within them. And even when there is green space, such as um, what is in our yards, it looks like this, um, which isn't really suitable um, functionally for birds um, and most other wildlife. Next slide. And this problem is only going to get worse. This is the housing density for 1940. Um, and uh, within, I guess, 90 years, we will have lost 150 million acres of ecologically productive land to urban sprawl. Um, and that is shown in the next slide. So this is the projected housing density for the year 2030 and the areas with um, a greater density of housing units per kilometer squared are represented by the orange, brown, and yellow. And as you can see um, in the east, there's quite a bit of a difference in um, urban density um, as compared to 1940. Um, so as you can see, this is quite, a, quite an issue. There are over 40 million acres of lawn in the United States, and it actually represents the single largest irrigated crop in the country. Um, we spend over 3 billion hours on lawn care every year, and we use over 800 million gallons of gas to mow our lawns. On top of that, we use 80 million pounds of pesticides, which are applied at the same rate as crops. The plants that are present in urban areas tend to be about 80% non-native, meaning that it is a plant um, or it is a plant that is living outside of its native distributional range. Um, and this generally results from human introduction. And this landscape was designed for convenience um, and maybe pest, resistant, pest resistance, but it wasn't designed to share with other living things. And while these ornamental plants may look pretty, they often don't have much value for insects or pollinators or birds or supporting food webs in general in urban areas. In Nebraska, the housing density issue isn't as much of a contributor to habitat loss, but we have quite a bit of row crop agriculture and conversion of land to other types of monocultures of non-native plants, which also contribute to losses of native plants and therefore um, wildlife species diversity in general. So what really makes up the difference between these natives and non-native plants are that uh, these plants are the foundation of the ecosystem. And the vast majority of the animals that are eating plants are insects, which of course are eaten by other animals. And native plants and insects co-evolved over millions of years. So specialization is really the key there. 90% of the insects that eat plants 
can only eat the native plants that they evolved with. So those native insects aren't adapted to feed on the non-natives that dominate that traditional urban and suburban landscape. And that's where the disconnect is. If the insects can't eat the plants in the landscape, the food chain's pretty much broken. And without insects, there's, we don't really have any birds, we lose all of our biodiversity. So we call it the Plants for Birds program, but it's really the Plants for Birds, for Bugs, for Everything Else program, but it's not quite as catchy. Um, and that's because many species of birds rely on those insects for their food source. Um, for instance, 96% of land birds need to feed their uh, young insects, and even those nectar feeders, um, like hummingbirds, need caterpillars for the young because it's a great source of fat and protein. So. One example of a fantastic insect plant is the native oak, which is among one of the best caterpillar species, um, caterpillar trees, and they're utilized by over 100 times as many caterpillar species as all of the native, uh, the non-native ginkgos, excuse me. And of course, trees always haven't been as prevalent as they are now in Nebraska but a lot of the birds that live and migrate through Nebraska have come to depend on those trees. And urban forests provide a ton of benefits for those birds in addition to people. Um, so there are many native trees that host just astonishing numbers of different kinds of species of caterpillar. Um, so, and that equates to a lot of birds, uh, food for birds, excuse me. One example of uh, birds that demonstrate the need for insects is the chickadee. We talked about those a little bit in a previous presentation, but for a little bit more context, chickadees weigh about the same as two nickels. So they're, they're really, really tiny, but a single nest of chicks needs over 9,000 caterpillars in the 16 days it takes for that nest to fledge, which comes out to about 390 to 570 caterpillars per day. Um, so they're super, super important, especially during breeding season. And another example of the need for native trees is uh, this bird dropping uh, mimic, which uses willows. Um, and they're among the 500, 456 species of caterpillar, caterpillar that uses the willows. But this one metamorphoses into the viceroy butterfly which obviously mimics the infamous monarch. And of course, native plants don't provide uh, just insects for birds. They provide overwintering and nesting habitat, uh, plants like grasses and um, shrubs are great for seeds and berries in the winter when those insects aren't around anymore. And then of course they add vertical and structural habitat and complexity to the landscape for sheltering and nesting. In addition to the suite of wildlife benefits that native plants provide, they provide a number of ecosystem services that um, are really beneficial for people and communities. For instance, um, Nebraska native plants require four times less water than non-natives and turf grass. And they also require fewer pesticides and herbicides um, because we're trying to support those insects that um, might be eating the plants but um, ultimately serve a greater purpose. And um, native plants are really important because around 40 to 60 percent of lawn pesticides leach into our groundwater. So um, they help to improve our groundwater quality by um, eliminating that need for pesticide and herbicide application. They also help to mitigate stormwater um, runoff and uh, flood, they provide a flood mitigation benefit and they provide some structure to our soil to reduce erosion and runoff. And finally, um, they help to sequester carbon from our atmosphere and pr provide some uh, climate change mitigation. And while they um, provide a lot of ecosystem services and even economic services, um, they may also just provide a beautiful aesthetic to your yard and provide some curb appeal. And we have some really great Nebraska examples of native plant yards. Um, and while not everyone has the time or space to commit to a major native's yard, we have a few pictures of different um, 
different scales that you can uh, apply this type of thinking to. So this one is a complete natives yard in Lincoln, Nebraska, and um, it looks really beautiful. And as you can see, it supports some pollinators there. Here are some examples of shade plants. Uh, Solomon seal and columbine are really great plants for hummingbirds. They provide nectar and they're great in shade, shady areas. Here is a habitat patch in um, a Nebraska native's backyard. And um, she has some uh, New England aster, which is a great pollinator plant. And the next one um, is a yard in Kearney, Nebraska, which has, it's, it's really beautiful because it just looks so intentional and um, he does a really good job of maintaining his plants. And that is some purple prairie clover attracting a bee. So we've been doing a lot of plants for birds work at both Nebraska Audubon centers. And together we've put in uh, over a thousand native plants in the ground just this year. And that has been hugely in part with a number of local native specializing nurseries that have been just instrumental in this whole process. But at Spring Creek, we have been work we worked with a local Girl Scout to do a planting at the New Creek Public Library. And in this picture, we recently um, took a disturbed site from some path construction, and we planted it with another 200 native plants um, at a big volunteer day, which was a lot of fun. Uh, we've also been really fortunate to reach a lot of diverse audiences with our community presentations. For example, at the beginning of the year, we started with a couple church green teams, and uh, now it's a group of over 50 people representing several ch churches, city groups, environmental groups, a bunch of individuals that joined in. Um, and by bringing those groups into the same room, we've been seeing a lot of collaboration going on and getting a lot more independent Plants for Birds projects going. But as far as Plants for Birds Pro, We've been fortunate to get a proclamation with the state that proclaimed the first week of June as Nebraska Wildflower Week. And we recently finished a resolution with ne the Nebraska Wachiska Audubon Society uh, to promote native plant use in their own lands. And once COVID lets up, we're hoping to work with Habitat for Humanity to develop some lawn care programming around native plant use. Three minutes. Okay, we're almost wrapping up here. <laughs> um, so I'm working out of Rose Sanctuary and um, that's more in the central part of Nebraska. So um, we've only been involved with plans for birds, um, I'd say within the last two years. And um, last year we did a native garden tour through a Kearney, Nebraska gardener's um, yard. And that was the um, Jonathan Nicola yard that I showed you a little bit earlier. Um, we also did a seed harvest event out at Rose Sanctuary where people could learn how to harvest prairie seeds and also learn about some plants that they could also plant in their own yard. Um, and prairie plants look super beautiful in your landscaping. Um, we also have done a lot of community presentations and um, currently I'm working on a Nebraska native plant list where people can um, find it really easy to, to curate their own plant list that would um, work best for their own yard and community. Um, and right now I'm working on this larger project that is a native plant natural playscape in central Nebraska. And I'm coordinating with um, University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension Office to create this um, design for a natural playscape that incorporates native plants. Um, and I'm choosing a lot of native plants that provide sensory benefits as well. So kids can really just learn and explore in this completely immersive um, environment and it's going to be really cool. And for that, we're um, coordinating with um, a few different uh, native plant growers in Nebraska to get some local ecotypes for that um, planting. Moving forward, um, we would like to develop some Nebraska specific online resources um, on our Audubon, respective Audubon websites, like I mentioned earlier. We would like to develop a resolution that can be signed by all Audubon chapters in Nebraska to commit to native plants. And we'd like to get more Plants for Birds representatives working with um, weed and invasive species boards and on city councils and things like that. 
we'd like to place more plants for bird signs in um, communities just to increase awareness um, and provide um, some education opportunities about the importance of native plants. And finally, we would like to develop more community partnerships to um, really enhance and spread our reach with the Plants for Birds program in Nebraska. And that is it. So with that, um, thanks for listening and we would be happy to take questions.